from the Digital Media Center on the campus of Southern Oregon University in Ashland, Oregon. This is Ramping Up Your English, an educational program for intermediate level English language learners. Here's your host for Ramping Up Your English, John Letts. Welcome to Ramping Up Your English, winner of the Southern Oregon Television Award for Program of the Year and the Award for Best Educational Program. I'm the host and producer, John Letts. Ramping Up Your English is an educational support program for intermediate English learners. It's a program for people from all language backgrounds. Ramping Up Your English is also for people of all ages. If you've already passed the beginning stages of learning English and want to reach higher levels of proficiency, this program is designed to meet your needs. We take a content-based approach to helping you reach higher levels of English proficiency. Our current thematic unit is Animals. This is segment one of episode 51. We've begun to ramp up your skills in researching and reporting on animals. Now this would be a good time to choose an animal in which you have an interest. Learning about the subject and learning to share that knowledge in a more advanced way should provide plenty of motivation and excitement. So if you don't already have an animal in mind, Think about an animal that you've always wanted to know more about. Now here's your chance to explore. For our reports, we're gathering and then presenting the basic information that would be required in a school setting. We'll present this information in an informed, informal science context. The idea is to give the reader a mental image of our subject, as well as where and how it fits in with the natural world. We'll describe the animal and report on where it lives. We'll include the habitat. That's the focus of today's episode. We'll also report on the animal's classification and its reproduction and lifespan. Our research will further include the physical and behavior adaptations as well as its diet and comparing the subject to similar animals. So, so far, we've spent some previous episodes in describing an animal. We also learned about the range and distribution of various animals and how to report on them. Today, we take things a step further in looking at habitat. We'll also classify the distinction, or I mean clarify the distinction between range and habitat. So in this program, we're using these wildlife cards as our main source of information. If you don't have access to this source, I recommend using Wikipedia or the good old-fashioned encyclopedia as a source. Both strive to be factual and both are organized in a similar way to the wildlife cards. This map is from a wildlife card on river otters and shows the otter's distribution range. Now, otters live near bodies of water. They are commonly found near rivers, but also lakes and marshes. Now, if you're familiar with North American geography, you'll recognize that these areas, marked in red, of the continent have abundant water bodies. So it's not unusual that river otters are found in these areas. Now, we'll explore the connection between the distribution and habitats of river otters. But first, let's look at the distribution patterns of some other animals. The American black bear is more widely distributed than river otters. Its range is represented by the red areas on the map. So we can instantly see the contrast between the range of the grizzly bear with the black bear. It's much more restricted than the black bear. Now this is an upside down view of Earth showing the range of the polar bear. Uh, there are habitat connections with them as well. For now, we're going to explore the distribution of this animal. This is a Virginia opossum. Now, opossums are North America's only marsupial, an early form of mammal that's not common in today's world. Before we dig into its range, let's learn more about this surprising animal. Meet one of America's most adaptable animals, the Virginia opossum. This one has a name, it's Violet. 
She was my guest on a recent episode of Adventures in Education, along with Leela Goulet and Julianne Rose. Let's learn about Violet and all her kin. And as you notice, we have another guest here. Can you uh, introduce our our third guest? Of course. This is Violet, and Violet, Violet is a Virginia opossum. And believe it or not, even though we see them all over the state of Oregon, they're not an animal that are native to this state. So have they spread out over all this time? They They've have. Kind of followed the pioneers out here? They sure have. <laughs> yep, their natural range is east of the Mississippi River. Wow. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that makes them so able to spread is they are very much an opportunistic eater. So they are able to eat pretty much anything and everything that they find when they're foraging out in the wild. And they are able to reproduce quite quickly. And they have up to 13 babies at a time. Well, you talking about the babies reminds me. Way back I was working at Jackson Elementary School. Mm -hmm. And one day I was teaching fifth grade and my, uh, about four kids came in late. And, and they were pretty responsible kids. So I said, what's going on? Why are you late to school? Well, Mr. Letts, we saw a possum uh, crossing the street, and there were all these baby possums going after her, oh. and we had to, tr to stop traffic so they could get across oh. the street successfully. <laughs> I said, story. well, you're not in trouble. You just, you know, your, your stock just went up. Yes, you know? A plus. <laughs> of course. A plus yeah. Stock, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so they, were, they definitely had that lesson of, uh, of respecting animals and, and uh, caring for animals. So uh, possums don't have the best PR in the world. Let's put it that way. It's true, they don't, which is unfortunate because really they do a lot of great things for our planet. A lot of people think that they're dirty, gross animals. But one of the neat things about them is they actually cannot harbor the rabies virus. So wow, people look at them and think they're mean and they're going to get bitten and get sick, but their body is too cold for that virus to thrive. And they also are lovers of ticks. Ticks are one of their favorite foods in the entire world, and they eat tons and tons of them throughout the year, and they help to eradicate Lyme's disease wherever they are found. Well, you're a hero then. <laughs> she sure yes. is. Now, they're, the, they're a marsupial, right? They are, yep. So she's got a pouch right here underneath her tummy, and that's where she would carry her babies until they were old enough to cling in her fur here. Oh, wow. Now, I hear you've actually seen the babies taking the ride on mom. We have, yeah. And it's amazing that she's able to still move because they really pack from the head down to the tail on there. And it looks like she's got quite a load, but she can still scurry up and down a tree and run across the road. So they're able to carry them without a problem. Now, they're mostly nocturnal, is that right? They are, yes. So you're not going to see them out during the day very often. Usually when the sun's just going up or just coming down is when they'll come out and do all of their foraging and their activities. Now, they're so um, adaptable. It's, it's yes, pretty amazing. They are, and it's really neat that they've been able to thrive in a society where we've kind of started to take over really a lot of the natural spaces. And they do occasionally will get into things like garbage and they're great lovers of bird feeders and cat food that happens to be out in the neighborhood. So that's helped them to adapt for sure. Now I found out um, that there, there's a myth that I didn't know was a myth and that is that they hang upside down by their tail during the day. It's a very, That's not true, right? No, it's a very, very common misconception. And I think it's probably stemming from all the cartoons and the movies that portray them hanging. And as cute as, of an image as that is, they don't actually do that. They only hang from their tail if they really, really need to because that's not a comfortable thing for them. So they'll find a little tree branch crook and they'll curl up in there and go to sleep, but they won't hang. Now, I uh, know that people uh, are familiar with the term playing possum. Yes. That does have some basis in reality. It, it does. It's such an amazing adaptation that opossums have. Their body will trick itself into thinking that it is indeed dying. So if an animal, let's say a fox, is coming after her and she's not able to run away, she's going to flop over and look like she's dead. She's going to smell like she's dead. Her body's going to secrete a bunch of really gross fluids that no animal is going to want to eat. 
and she can stay that way for up to four hours. What an amazing yeah. adaptation. It really is fantastic. I got accused of playing possum when I was supposed to get up and do something and <laughs> stay in bed too long. So you're playing possum, aren't you? It's a compliment. Really. Yeah, I guess so. Well, this is, this is the kind of animal that you guys take out to schools to have students interact with? That's right, yeah. And a lot of our students that we visit say that they've seen them in the wild, but they've never been up close. They've never touched one. And a lot of the neat things about her are not things that are very well known. So it's really fun to get to share her with the students. Now, she's been raised a lot around people. That That's right? right, yeah. She was found as an orphan when she was just a month old. Oh. So we actually hand raised her, which was a big job. It was just mm -hmm. like having a baby, you know, feed every <laughs> two hours around the clock. So we lost a lot of sleep to this little one, but she was definitely worth it. Does she enjoy being pet? She seems to be quite comfortable oh. with it. Yeah, she doesn't shy away from okay. hands. She well, doesn't try to run away. And she's a lot softer than people a expect. A lot softer. You look at that fur and you think it's going to be real coarse, but actually it's pretty soft. Mm -hmm. I think the coolest part about her is her tail. You know, it almost looks like she has scales and she's missing that fur to be able to hold on to to branches. Isn't that oh, neat? Yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of cool. I've never <laughs> touched a possum tail before. <laughs> well, I can just imagine how excited the, the kids get. Just a reminder that most opossums are not tame like this one, and they come with very sharp teeth. If you see one, look, but don't touch. You're watching Ramping Up Your English on RVTV Voices. This is segment two of episode 51. We're reviewing distribution and exploring its relationship to habitat. Now this map shows the range of Virginia opossums. As you can see, these animals are found in many parts of the United States, much like the black bears we saw earlier. Now we're asking the question, why are some animals more widely distributed than others? Well, the answer to that question could well have to do with the habitat needs of the animal. In the case of Virginia opossums, the answer lies in their adaptability. They can have their needs met in many different habitats, so they're found in many different areas. They find that many of their needs are met where people live, so often that's where they're found. So just what are we talking about when we use the word habitat? Well, many confuse habitat with the area that an animal lives, but they're not the same thing. Now let's look at habitat as the needs an animal has. Now needs and habitats, these are common needs shared by all animals. It's no surprise that all animals need food, but not all animals need the same food, and animals have different ways of getting the food they can eat. So their habitat must supply food they can eat and food they can get from the environment in which they live. An example is a polar bear. Their main food is a seal, and they need large sheets of floating ice because of the way they hunt seals. Their habitat must have all these elements so they can get the food they need to survive. Now, water is an obvious need. Not every animal uses the same water source, though. Shelter is another issue. Some rabbits need thick vegetation in which to hide and escape predators. Deer seem to only need some soft grass on which to bed down and some trees for the shade they produce. Shelter needs change with the place animals occupy in their life cycle. A bird's nest provides shelter for their eggs and the defenseless chicks that hatch from them. Space is a need that's sometimes more subtle than the other needs. A cougar needs lots of area in which to roam and find prey. A raccoon may only need an acre or two to meet its needs. Deprived of sufficient space, some animals may survive, but they'll be stressed and they won't thrive. Here's a North American animal that's highly adaptable. Much like the Virginia opossum we saw earlier, raccoons are easily recognized by their dark area around their eyes and their ringed tails. Like all animals, they need a habitat that will meet their specific needs. They're larger than a cat, but smaller than many dogs. 
This raccoon was spotted near a dwelling along the Umpqua River in Oregon. Now, while capable of finding food in a range of habitats, this individual was looking for something that people may have left behind. So raccoons are not shy around people. Like the Virginia opossum, they get some of their habitat needs met wherever people live, including urban areas. Originally, raccoons lived in wooded areas in the forest, where they are still very much at home. Most are found around sources of water, which they drink, and in which they wash their food. Now, speaking of food, in the forest, they find nuts, seeds, berries, and invertebrates on which to feed. In urban and suburban areas, they use their dexterous front paws to manipulate human-produced food. They seem to specialize in opening garbage cans and even food containers. Food left out for pets is also a favorite, as well as pet food inside a house with dog doors. Yes, they'll come right inside and empty the dish. In terms of shelter, the forest provides bountiful places for raccoons to hide from predators and raise their young. In areas dominated by people, they find shelter in buildings, culverts, and storm drains, and one took up residence in my garage. So out on the front of the uh, wildlife card on raccoons, we can see that they, arrange, they have their range all the way across the United States and parts of Canada and Mexico. Now, if you're familiar with North American geography, you'll notice that two mountain ranges from which the raccoons are absent, the Rocky Mountains and the Cascade Mountains. Raccoons are absent from central Mexico as well, perhaps because of the arid climate. Now, inside the wildlife card, there's a section devoted to habitat. We read here that raccoons are natives of forests and swamps in areas of temperate climate. Now, we're scanning this wildlife card for facts. We write down information from the source, not the wording between the facts. So here are some notes that would be helpful. Forests, swamps, urban, suburban. For food, we wrote down nuts, seeds, berries, invertebrates, human food, pet food. For water, we wrote that they choose to live a short distance from water. Shelter, we wrote down cavities in trees, abandoned nests of other animals, and dwellings made by humans. Now, with this list of notes, let's create some sentences about habitats of raccoons. Here are a few examples using the notes we took. I put some of the wording in all capital letters, and this gives you some phrases you can use in the activity and other descriptions of animals' habitat. So here's what I wrote down. Since raccoons are so widely distributed in North America, uh, let's see, uh, let's begin with the connection between their range and the habitat. Raccoons populate most areas of North America, as well as southern Canada and parts of Mexico. They thrive in places where people live, finding food, water, and shelter where there are humans. Now, their traditional habitats are forests, and swamps. And both areas provide ample food in the form of nuts, berries, seeds, and invertebrates. Sources of water are often present there. Trees provide shelter in the nests of other animals and in naturally occurring cavities. Now, raccoons also have spread out from those areas to the cities and towns of people, uh, finding ample food in the garbage cans and pet feeders there. As for shelter, raccoons make themselves at home in human-built dwellings, as well as culverts and storm sewers. Now again, I've written the words that connect your notes in all capital letters. These words and phrases can be used to describe the habitats of many animals. You'll find this list on my website, letscreate.org. Now, while you might find a first draft of your sentences are a little rough, your advantage in writing them is much greater than just copying the words used on the wildlife cards. Now, earlier in this episode, I said I would help you make a connection between an animal's distribution and their habitats. I also promised to help you distinguish between the two. So let's start with the raccoon. You'll remember that they pretty much cover the continent of North America. That's their distribution. Now, when you think about their habitats, 
you can see why they're spread out so widely. When it comes to getting their needs met with food, water, shelter, and space, they can meet those needs just about anywhere that people live. And they do. Perhaps we should look at where they don't live. Northern Canada and the peaks of the Rocky Mountains and the Cascade Mountain Range. These are areas that cross the limit of what they can do to get their needs met. We know that these areas are very cold in the winter, so you could say that raccoons could live in a number of habitats, but not in alpine or arctic areas. Now looking south into Mexico, their distribution ends in an area called the tropics. These areas have extremes as well as the alpine and arctic areas, but instead of being too cold, they're too hot. Any animal that can live in so many different habitats, from the deserts of Arizona to the subtropics of Florida, can be said to be highly adaptable. That means they can get their needs met for food, water, shelter, and space, get those needs met in many different ways. And that's another way of saying that many habitats will work for raccoons. Now, in contrast to the raccoon, the grizzly bear is only found in a small part of North America. When we look at a grizzly bear's habitat, we see that these om omnivores have some great adaptations for survival, especially in their grasslands habitat. They are known as apex predators. They get the prey on numerous animals, but virtually nothing preys on them. They are powerful and fairly adaptable. So why aren't they more widely distributed? Look in the mirror and you'll find the answer you'll see the most dangerous predator of all. Grizzly bears are not adaptable to living near people. So as humans develop homes in grizzly territory, grizzlies lose the habitat that once served them so well. Now, people have often feared grizzly bears and killed them as a result. So they've retreated to the mountains and the vast spaces of Alaska as a result. With fearful humans and their guns, and developments, grizzly bears lose the habitat space, their need of space. Not only is their distribution not expanding, it's rapidly shrinking. So we can see how the habitat and distribution are linked to each other. Adaptability to different habitats can result in wider distribution. A shrinking habitat often results in a shrinking distribution. But how are habitat and distribution different well, distribution or range can be seen on a map and described in geographic terms, but habitat refers to the kinds of conditions that meet an animal's needs. A river otter needs bodies of water, rivers, lakes, and marsh. Those kinds of areas are its habitat, whether they're located in Florida or in Oregon. Now, another North American animal that has extended its range is the gray squirrel. Um, this uh, Native American, you could say, animal was uh, introduced to a similar habitat in England. The result is that the gray squirrel is flourishing there. It's a great example of the role that opportunity plays in distribution. Let's learn more about gray squirrels in this video. Bushy tail and relatively small body give this animal away. It's a gray squirrel a common sight in the forests of southern Oregon. These squirrels are such familiar sights because they come out during the day, unlike some species that are nocturnal. Gray squirrels are our primary consumers. They feed on the seeds of plants rather than the plants themselves. Gray squirrels seem to take their human neighbors in stride. In fact, when I've been too close to a squirrel, I've been scolded, fussed at. In the forest where I live, squirrels mostly go about their business of gathering seeds, ignoring me and my family. Here we watch a gray squirrel stripping a pine cone, seeking the seeds inside. Squirrels are busy in the fall, storing up seeds for the winter when food may be scarce. In English, we have some sayings about squirrels. One is to squirrel away something, which means to save it. Another is to say that someone is squirrely, meaning they can't seem to be still. That's especially applied to children. 
Some teachers even refer to their whole class on some days as being squirrels. One of the movements of a squirrel is no movement at all, whether on the ground like this, or on the side of a tree, squirrels sometimes stay perfectly still to avoid danger. Other times, they make a run for it. This squirrel is getting seeds from this grassy plant. It disappears among the vegetation. That's another adaptation of squirrels to blend into their surroundings. Can you see the squirrel now? Now it's back at work harvesting seeds from the plants. Notice the eyes on the side of its head, allowing it to spot approaching predators. Squirrels have good control of their forepaws, helping them strip the seeds from the plants. These same forefeet have claws that make them great climbers of trees. Look how much control this squirrel has of this fur cone it's picked up. It holds the cone up to its mouth. That's where its sharp teeth strip the cone. This western gray squirrel is distinct from the eastern gray squirrel. It's a smaller squirrel. Notice the narrow ears with rounded tips and the oval walnut shaped eyes. Also note the white belly. If you listen carefully you can hear it eating. Having finished this cone, it seeks out another and finds one that's just right. These squirrels nest in trees. That's where they raise their young and store their food. It's rare to see a baby squirrel on the ground, but not the adults. Feeding on the ground like this squirrel is when I see squirrels the most. That and chasing each other around tree trunks. Squirrels have their playful moments, but mostly they're about getting food. You're watching Ramping Up Your English on RVTV Voices. This is segment three of episode 51. And in this episode, we've taken a look at the habitats of Virginia opossums, raccoons, and gray squirrels. Besides all living in North America, these animals have some things in common. And we can look for patterns as we learn more about gray squirrels. Our primary source of information is we're using the wildlife card published by International Masters Publishers. And this is one about gray squirrels. These cards, known as wildlife explorer cards, contain accurate and well-organized information about animals. So what we're looking at here is some of the information found inside about the habitat of gray squirrels. We find information about the types of areas that uh, meet the habitat needs of gray squirrels in contrast to the information we learned about raccoons. This section doesn't go into detail about the, what the gray squirrel eats. Most of the detail is about the type of woodlands they inhabit and the importance of their shelter, the dray or the nest where squirrels sleep and spend much of the winter. Now here are some more informations about wildlife cards. Uh, notice the words adaptable in the first and last sentence. And that brings us to the feature that we're looking at here. Uh, so that's common among the three animals we're looking at today. The Virginia possum, the raccoon, and the gray squirrel, all highly adaptable around human habitation. Now they also inhabit woodlands, and this book from National Geographic has all kind of information about woodlands. It's the kind of book you can stick in your pocket. In fact, it's called A Pocket Guide. You might find one at the library and you might find this by visiting the National Geographic website and see if they still offer subscriptions on those. If you've chosen an animal in which to research and write a report, see what you can find out about the habitat and how the habitat relates to the animal's distribution and range. Remember, while habitat and range were often related, an animal's habitat is where its needs for food, water, shelter, and space are found. The range is the geographic area where the animal has been found to live. All the materials used in this episode can be found at my website, letscreate.org. There you can watch this episode again and find all the episodes of Ramping Up Your English. This is episode 51, Habitats. 
You can also watch and even download all episodes of Ramping Up Your English on archive.org slash details slash rogue TV. Use the search box by entering Ramping Up Your English. You'll also find the episodes there, all of them. So Ramping Up Your English can be seen in Ashland on Channel 15 on the Ashland Home Network and in the rest of Southern Oregon on Charter Cable Channel 182. Showtimes are 8 o'clock a.m. on Mondays and 7.30 p.m. on Thursdays. Showtimes will vary in different areas. Check your local public access and education stations. I want to thank my director, Denise Ross, and my talented and royal clue. My, they're not royal, they're loyal, though. And I want to thank you, our viewers. All of you helped make this program an award winner. So join us next time for Ramping Up Your English. I'm John Letts. You've been watching Ramping Up Your English, a support program for intermediate level English language learners. Learn more. Visit our website at letscreate.org. You can also watch or download today's program at archive.org slash details slash rogue TV. Join us next time on RBTV Voices for Ramping Up Your English.